How's it going? There it is. All right, perfect. Thank you, guys. Um, simple words, but I think Fernando Ortega did a great job. And the Lord blessed when he uh, wrote that song. Can we pray together? Father, we continue to acknowledge your love and your presence here with us. We just lift up your name right now, and we ask that it would be your word that is heard here, and that it would be the message you wish every heart to hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> it's so much easier preaching than singing. <laughs> much more nervous singing. Oh. I'm going to continue uh, kind of in a, a series here uh, that I introduced last week, trying to illustrate the broader story that we're part of in, uh, in, in, in the biblical world and in the biblical message. And I'll, I'll dovetail a little bit for those of you who weren't here last week, um, uh, showing you where we went last week. But this is kind of part two of, of this idea of the story. And we're all in this story together. But the more we understand the characters of this story, the more we understand the turning points, the more we understand the heroes and the context, I think it benefits us and, and helps us grow in our faith journey with Jesus Christ. And so uh, Chuck mentioned this verse to me last week, and it's so rare that Chuck says anything of value. I thought I would share it with you. No, I'm just kidding. Chuck, if you're watching, you know I love you. <laughs> no, but it was very good. Chuck said, you know, your message last week reminded me of this verse, and uh, he was absolutely right on, because I was trying to to share that we are, we are the story that we're in is a lot more than just us and God and the devil. That, that was really the, the, the thing, and we sometimes lose focus on that, and we wonder, why isn't God doing this in my life, or why is the devil tempting me like this, and why is all this happening? And, and there's a ten tendency to have somewhat of a narrow focus, as though all God has to be concerned about is our circumstance. And by the way, God is very concerned about our circumstance, but he has to look at the, uh, the challenges that our entire world, and not even our world, our entire universe faces when the que with the question of sin. It's not always as singular easy as God just doing something uh, on our behalf. He has to consider the broader picture. And so Paul uses this phrase, and it's this is one of the most direct places that you can see it, but it's illustrated in other places in the Bible. He says, we have become a spectacle. And the word in Greek is literally theatron. It's where we get the word theater. Okay, we have become a theater, a spectacle, a stage to the world. And the Greek word for world is the word cosmos, uh, both the angels and to men. And cosmos can mean planet earth. It can mean that, but it can also mean what we would think of today, of the whole thing, the cosmos. So depending on the circumstance and the, the context, it can mean one or the other. And it's interesting that he says we become this to the world, both to angels and to men, and, and it's, it's almost Paul saying, look, we are on a broader stage than just you, me, God, and the devil. Okay, there is a whole nother a realm of existence that God, that the great controversy, the story that we're a part of, impacts. And we have to remember that the great controversy started in heaven. It didn't start in the Garden of Eden. It didn't start in Genesis 1. It started in heaven. Okay, and that creation itself was part of God's response to a rebellion that had already happened. We're in the middle of the story. We're in the middle of the story, and God has to take all these things into consideration. And um, by the way, just a little uh, side note for you uh, when it comes to uh, sermons. Anytime a preacher goes long, it's because of lack of preparation. It's just a, it's a, just a truth. Anytime a speaker, a preacher, a college speaker preacher at a wedding or whatever, whenever they go long, it's usually because of lack of preparation. I say that because this message was so long, I had to split it into three different sermons, Jeff, because, and so I needed more time for preparation, uh, and so I'm going to have to hold myself back on some of these things because they'll be illustrated later. But we are part of a greater thing, and so for today's message, I'm going to go into one of those ways in which God has dealt with us and, and illustrated his plan for us in the broader story, great controversy that we were part of. But I do have a kid's quiz. And if I could get Toby, would you mind helping me out? And George, you guys have been kind of our consistent team here. Love to have the kids participate with uh, the message. This is a, a custom I've had for many years now. Um, uh, I don't know if I've ever told you this before, but I got this from Davy Crockett. That's the truth. I got, I got starting uh, my sermons um, from Davy Crockett, Pastor Davy Crockett. He was a pastor in Yakima, and that's how he began his sermons, and his name is Dave Crockett. 
I'd be interested if anyone remembers that. <laughs> what three items were stored in the Ark of the Covenant? Here's some, some ideas here. A jar of something, an errand something. And, all right, we have uh, uh, Andre, right? Yeah. Jar of manna and Aaron's staff and the Ten Commandments. Wow! Just checked them right off right there. Did you guys hear him? He said he got it right. A jar of manna. He said Aaron's staff. Um, I put it here as an R. So Aaron's rod that budded, and then there the Ten Commandments as well. And Hebrews nine four mentions all three of these. But the you know, I said Aaron's rod that's budded. When you actually read it, Aaron's rod didn't just bud. It says that it budded, it blossomed, and it produced ripe almonds all overnight. This dead rod. So uh, part of God's plan was that these things were put into uh, the Ark of the Covenant. But the primary thing that was in the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments. Number two, what's the first commandment of the Ten, of course, is that you shall not make idols. You shall have no other gods before me. Remember the Sabbath day or honor your pastor and obey him at all times. Ketzia, I see Ketzia's hand. You shall have no other gods before me. That's wrong. I'm sorry. It's number four. To honor your pastor at all times. I'm surprised you didn't know that. I'm going to have to talk with your parents about that. No, I'm just kidding. You shall have no other gods before me. That is the first command that is part of the Decalogue, and uh, that's how God begins the Ten Commandments. What was the first set of Ten Commandments written on? Now, remember, there was the original set that Moses had that broke, right? So... Uh, That's the one I'm talking about. He later on carves a second set that God writes on. Now, there may be more than one answer. So go to this young lady. Yeah. Is the blue mic up and working, boys? Say it again. I I didn't quite hear you. Stone. I heard her say it that time. Yes, there are more than one answer to this. Okay, right here up front. Tablets. I don't think the blue mic is working. Hello? Oh, now it is. But I heard you say tablets. Anyone else want to throw your hat in the ring on this one? Stone and tablets? Okay, yeah, one more. Stone. Stone, you said stone as well. All right. Uh, This is one where where I, I, I am being a little bit tricky on you. Did you know it's all of the above? including the sapphire. We'll talk about the sapphire. Some of you may have heard this before, studied it before, um, but uh, I'll share with you kind of the idea and the context behind that. But yes, in the older uh, words, it would be called tables of stone. I, I actually brought, um, yes, they were written on tablets, right? Not this kind of tablet, but tablets. Okay, they were separate pieces of, of rock and stone uh, and sapphire. Sapphire. We'll, we'll, we'll look into that a little bit more. Normally, when you think of the Ten Commandments, virtually every time I've seen them illustrated, they're on this gray rock, right? Gray stones. Always with the curved top, of course. It wouldn't be appropriate if it didn't have that curved top. I don't know why that's the case, but it is. But what about sapphire? And I like how it makes a heart. Of course, you noticed that. I didn't have to point that out. What else? This is the last one, George and Toby. Thank you. When else did God's word become incarnate. So when God gave the Ten Commandments, he was embodying his word in a physical object. That's what the Ten Commandments were. When else did God's word become alive or flesh or embodied? Can you think? Okay, the young lady in in the back here again. What's your name? Melanie or Melody? Melanie. Jesus Cross. You got it directly correctly. That is right. We talked about this last week in the, in the Gospel of John. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate your help. When Jesus came to earth, John says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But there was another time that God's Word was incarnate, was embodied, was given. And that is when He gave the Ten Commandments. Now, sometimes when we think of uh, Jesus' role, it, it's not uncommon in, in, in the Seventh-day Adventist uh, Bible study and the Seventh-day Adventist teachings that we see how Jesus is the fulfillment of the sanctuary, right? That Jesus is the Lamb, 
right? That was the, all the other sacrifices were to point to Jesus. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus is the light that was in the sanctuary. Jesus is the bread. The oil that fed the, the, the candlestick. That was the Holy Spirit, right? We see that the sanctuary is an illustration or an embodiment or a, a, a symbol for the person of Jesus Christ. But in, uh, in, in the same way or in a similar way, the law itself, those two tablets, given to Moses, also are an embodiment of Jesus Christ. And when you think about the sanctuary itself, the whole thing existed to house and surround the Ten Commandments. Okay, So when you think about how God uh, orchestrated the, the holy people living in the holy land, had a holy mountain upon which the holy temple sat. Okay, And in the holy temple there was a holy place, and then a part of the, the temple was the most holy place. And what was in the middle of that most holy place? It was the Ark of the Covenant. And what was in the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments. Not just the idea of the Ten Commandments. Not just the meaning of the Ten Commandments. But the actual written on tablets or stones that God had given Moses. At least uh, at one point, and then uh, a change took place, and we'll talk about that. But in the same way that God gave Moses an incarnation of his word, just as Jesus was the incarnation of the word, they follow the same pattern. They both came from heaven. They both are representatives of God's character. Both Jesus and the law are given, sent to us as a blessing, as a guide, as instruction, okay? Both of them were broken, just as the body of Jesus was broken, right? Every time we have communion and we break the bread, it wasn't his bones, but his body was broken. We break the bread to illustrate the broken body of Jesus, and both are restored and returned to heaven and uh, illustrate further on the story and the role of the law within the story of the Bible and of God's plan for our life. So I want to illustrate with this with you this morning. Now, if you've never seen this before, I wanted to throw, we sometimes say this a lot in the church, but we fail to always illustrate it, how the law is a transcript of God's character. And what we mean by that, and it's really not that difficult or logical, any organization, any country, any family can be defined by its rules, right? How do you know if a country is a democracy or socialist or communist? You look at their laws, right? And you say their laws tell you what the character of that country is. When you want to know what a business is, a business-free market, what what is it? You look at their rules that define what they are. So it's not a radical idea to say that the law of God is a transcript of his character. But biblically, when we say that, these are this is an illustration of what we mean by that. Most or all that, that I can find of the adjectives or words that illustrate the character of God are also used to describe his law. So the Bible says that God is pure, God is truth, he's good, he's just, he's holy, right? The Bible says those same things about his law. His law is pure, truth, good, just, holy, perfect. By the way, there's a lot more we could add to this list. I'm adding to it all the time. As a matter of fact, there's one on here that needs to be added that I haven't put on yet. The Bible says that God is love, righteous, wonderful. That was one I added a few years ago. The Bible says God is wonderful. Remember, for unto us a child is given and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. You read that before around Christmas time, maybe. All right. Uh, The Bible says in Psalm 119 that his law, his testimonies are wonderful. As God is spiritual, God is immutable or unchangeable. God is eternal. The Bible says the same thing about his law. One that I haven't added yet. The Bible says that God is complete. God is satisfactory. The Bible also says that his law is complete. And satisfactory. Again, you can just continue to see more ways in which the Bible says, look, everything you need to know about God and his character, you can find in his law. It is a transcript of his character. Okay? Some of you have seen this before. This is not, uh, this is not profound. Uh, the, the one that, that is, is good to remind ourselves of, but the Bible says in many places and in many ways, not only that God is unchangeable, I am the Lord, he says in Malachi, I therefore, and I change not, therefore you are not consumed, O Jacob. Okay, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord. Uh, there, in me there is no shadow of turning, right? Lots of places it talks about God not changing. The, the same is said about his law and repeated in multiple places that he does not change his law. His law is unchangeable, immutable, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot nor tittle by any means fail. 
from the law. So that's what we mean when we say the law is a transcript of God's character. And it's important to remember this because sometimes as Christians, maybe not so much in the Seventh-day Adventist church, but it does filter into the church. Some people want to, to say, well, but aren't there, eh, there's cultural context and what if we did this and that? Well, we do need to always look at things in, in context, but in, 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 in essence, to whatever degree we challenge the law, To the same degree, we are challenging the character of God. So those two must be considered. And so um, that is what we're looking at. Now, I want to talk with you about this whole idea of the sapphire law. So within many Jewish traditions, this is common. It's something that is not widely uh, uh, studied or, or, or explained in many Christian circles. But this is the origin of that. The Bible says there's about five places in the Bible where Moses specifically talks about receiving the original tablets from God. Okay, he talks about it a couple of times in Exodus. He talks about it a couple of times in Deuteronomy. Um, He talks about the experience of being on the mountain, okay, and and God handing him the original tablets. And this is one of those places that is very interesting. Exodus 24, just a few chapters after the, the, the Decalogue is given, right? Exodus 20 is where the first time we have the Ten Commandments uh, given to us, which, by the way, I don't want to miss this. I don't have a lot of time to wax eloquent on it. But in Hebrew, the phrase Ten Commandments is not found. That's not there. In Hebrew, it's Aseret Hadabarim. It means the Ten words. The ten word. Dabarin is the uh, uh, Hebrew equivalent of logos, all right? In the Greek, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word, the logos. In Hebrew, that would be in the beginning was the Dabarin. In the beginning was the word. Uh, John is specifically tying in the person of Jesus Christ, not only with what I said last week about logos meaning much more than the person of Jesus, but the, the, the purpose and the logic and the reason and all the things that logos means, but he's specifically tying in the character of Jesus with the Ten Commandments. Now, by the way, to call them commandments is not inaccurate or wrong. That's what the Word of God is. All right, it is his will. It is the expressed purpose of God. But we are somewhat interpreting it when we call it the Ten Commandments. Not that it's wrong, but literally within the Hebrew language, the Ten Commandments are called the Ten Words. The Word. And again, last week I talked about how Genesis 1-1 was the first seven words. These things were very significant um, uh, within the Hebrew mindset. Uh, and that will uh, play into this just a little bit. So Moses is now describing the process of God giving him the Ten Commandments. And he, it says that there were boundaries by which the, the children of Israel had to stay away from the mountain. But at one point, God says, Moses, I need you, Aaron, his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders. I want you to come up to me. I want, I want you all to come up to me. And so in Exodus 24, they do that. And it says this, and they saw the God of Israel. Now, I don't have time to get into that and what that means and why that's significant and how that plays into this. I'll let you study that out on your own time. But they get this wonderful revelation of God seated on his throne. And it says, and under his feet, there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Very interesting. God gives them this wonderful vision, this wonderful appearance of his, of his, his form. And now what this, they're actually seeing again is interesting because Jesus says no man has ever seen the Father and Moses was not allowed to see. So this is a, some sort of a vision or some sort of a revelation to some degree. Again, we could talk about that more later, but it is emphasized and illustrated that God is seated on his throne and at his feet is this stone pavement of sapphire. Okay, just a few verses later then, Moses says, Now the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and remain there, and I will give you the stone tablets with the law. Now, the, again, there, there's a bit of a, 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 a subjecture or, or a supposition to this conjecture. Up until this point, the only stone that has been mentioned is that pavement of sapphire. The Lord doesn't say, I will give you a stone tablet. He doesn't leave it without an article and say, just stone tablets. He uses that definite article. Remember that pavement of stone? I'm going to give you the, that pavement of sapphire, I'm going to give you the stone tablets with the law. 
Okay? The only stone that has been spoken about at this point is that pavement of sapphire. And so there has been an, a, 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 an interpretation, there has been a theory, there's been an idea that the original stone tablets given to Moses were not just sandstone that God chipped out of the wall of the rock, or as if you've seen the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, the fire comes out and, and, and does the little zip cut thing and pulls it out, that it wasn't just the basic elements of earth that God gave to Moses, but he literally, literally picks out of the foundation of his throne from heaven the established law, he carves on it the ten words, and he hands them to Moses from heaven itself. Now again, I don't force that upon you. You can say I'm crazy. You, you can, you can, again, there's nothing that demands this. All right? You're not gonna, uh, uh, you know, be judged if you disagree, but you'll be wise if you agree. And, um, but here is the idea. Now, you may say, well, that's interesting. There's a couple of leaps there. But you can't help but see that from this point forward, the color blue begins to take a significant meaning within the Jewish culture as it relates to the law. And I want to illustrate with that to you for in a couple of ways and, and, and come back to this idea of Jesus embodying the same journey that the law did. The blue law. Now, I put this up before it, it hit me. I'm not talking about blue laws, like laws that regulate Sabbath duties. It, it didn't hit me until after I had been too far and I couldn't change it. The origin of blue laws, we really don't know where that term blue law comes from, and I'm not talking about that, although it's ironic that blue laws are religious in nature. Anyways, the blue law as it relates to the Bible. First of all, when Ezekiel, very similar to Moses in Exodus 24, when Ezekiel is given a vision of God's throne in both Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10, he describes God's very throne as blue and made out of sapphire lapis lazuli. God is literally shown in vision as seated on a blue throne, a sapphire throne. And that would make sense why at his feet would also be sapphire. Okay, so God's very authority the very seat that describes, you know, his sovereignty, okay, is described in the Bible as sapphire, as blue. He sits upon a blue throne. This is also illustrated in more uh, direct and um, significant way with the blue tassels that the Hebrews were commanded to wear. Remember the story of the woman who reached out to grab Jesus? Some of your Bible says that he, she touched the hem of his garment. Okay, well, the hem of a Jewish garment would always have a blue tassel attached to it. She literally reaches out and touches one of the tassels. You know, a tassel is a little twisting of, uh, of fabric together. All right. Now, why did God say that the Jews needed to wear tassels uh, on their garments? He tells us this in Numbers 15. He says, they shall put on the tassel of each corner, four corners of their robe, a cord of blue. It had to be blue. Why? It shall be a tassel for you to look and remember what? The commandments. The blue tassel, the color blue, symbolically illustrated the law of God, the commandments of God. So the, the Hebrews literally were to wear four tassels on their robe so that every step they took was guided by the path of the law, that they would never step outside of God's will, that the character of God would define every step that they took. Oh, that's what the purpose was there for. It wasn't just a, a, a common dress feature that God said, you're going to look good in blue, guys, wear blue. Okay? It was the purpose of reminding them about their obligation to God and that His character is surrounding them and He wants them to always stay within His character. It goes on to say it shall be a tassel for all the commandments of the Lord so as to do them and not follow after your own heart and your own eyes after which you played the harlot. What was the first command of the Decalogue? You shall have how many gods? No other gods. The very first command is don't play the harlot. Don't follow after other gods. And the tassels were to be a reminder of the command of the Lord, the character of God, and to stay within faithfulness to God so that you remember to do all my commandments and be holy to your God. The high priest, what color is he wearing on the Day of Atonement? He only wore this on the Day of Atonement. What's the prominent color that you see on the high priest? Blue. 
He was to shield his, normally 359 days a year, they had a 360 day calendar. 359 days, he wore a white tunic. He looked just like the rest of the priests. You could not tell just by looking at him who was the high priest and who wasn't. Every day of the year, the high priest looked like the rest of the priests. But on the day of atonement, he put on the sacred garb and he was to put blue uh, as the main thing over his body, showing that he is within the, the, the boundaries of the law of God, that the law of God is defining him as he stands before the ark of God, which also housed the law of God that originally may have been, and I believe was, not on just regular sandstone, but carved from the footstool of God himself from heaven on that pavement of sapphire. Now, this is to be contrasted, by the way. The, the high priest wore blue, but he was also instructed to wear scarlet, purple, and gold as part of the different parts of his dress, okay? Um, there's a kind of a contrast with the woman of Babylon in Re- Revelation 17. What was she wearing? What colors was she wearing? Purple, scarlet, and gold. What is she missing? She's missing the blue. She's missing the law. She has neglected the law. She's left the character of God out of her governance, out of her theology, out of her commands. She has no uh, authority because she has left God out of it. She has no blue on her whatsoever. And again, to, to Jews that were in this culture, when they would read that, they would pick that out. Oh, just like the high priest has scarlet. Okay, the high priest has scarlet. High priest has purple, uh, representing, uh, you know, royalty. The high priest had gold, representing purity. But where's the blue? No blue. So Jesus, just as Jesus came from heaven, so also did those Ten Commandments originally come from heaven. They were the physical embodiment. And now remember, I put this in the context of the great controversy. It's not just about us on here. When God took from his very throne room those tablets, it was a message to the universe. It was a message to unfallen worlds. It was a message to angels, to, 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 uh, uh, to, to the demons, to the fallen angels too, about how God has established his character and the lengths to which God would go to redeem his people. He would literally take from his throne room the foundation of his authority and he would etch on that his character. By the way, Jews had a lot of interesting theories about this. One of them, oh, you can look it up, uh, but one of them was that that the the tablets were not engraved upon. They were actually uh, uh, fully pierced through. What would you call that? So, you know, you could see daylight through them. And mystical Judaism taught that you could turn that tablet around and you could read it the same as it was on the front. And uh, they have a lot of very, very profound and interesting, some of it rather thought-provoking, some of it kind of wild about what, what God actually did. As I've t- spoken already, the law was a transcript of God's character given, sent as a blessing. Now, what about it being broken? So Moses comes down from the mountain, if you remember in the story, and the children of Israel have rebelled. They have played the harlot. They've made the golden calf. And what does Moses do with those first tablets given to him by God? Those potentially sapphire, heavenly tablets. The embodiment of God's character. What does he do with them? Smashes them to the ground. They're broken. In response to the rebellion of God's people, the law is broken. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Wasn't it in response to the sins of our, of, of our sins that Jesus allowed himself to be broken? So in the same way that those laws were broken in response to the, the, the wickedness of, of God's people, so too was Jesus broken. But now this idea of what happened to those broken pieces. Have you ever wondered that? When Moses broke the Ten Commandments, the original tablets those original laws given to him by God, those precious, you know, heavenly things given to him. What happened to the pieces? Any of you ever, do any of you have a piece of the Berlin Wall? That was a big deal for a while. My sister has a piece. I think she saw a piece. She got to go to Germany. That was a big deal. Um, you know, people kept pieces of, of broken things after 9-11. People kept, now I just, I throw that out there because don't you think that when Moses threw those pieces down, that those pieces were still extremely significant. They would be a memorial. They would be collected. They would be 
maybe attempted to be glued back together or something. You know, the Bible never says a word that I found about what happened to the pieces of the original tablets given to Moses. I've not found a single reference to the pieces. The Bible says that Moses carved out a new set and took it up to God, and then God still, it was still his handwriting. That set, the second set, is the set that goes into the Ark of the Covenant. And it's that set that then sits in the temple. But it never says what happened to those original broken tablets. What happened to them? Well, again, this is just theory. This is just an idea. And I think it is significant. Do you know that Ellen White on several times in vision says that she got the privilege of seeing the temple in heaven and that she saw the Ark of the Covenant open. And when she looked into the Ark, she saw the, quote, original tablets written by the finger of God. Here's one of those places. There's about a dozen places where she says this. This is from the Bible commentary. Safe in the archives of heaven, in the ark of God, here it is, are the original commandments written upon the two tables of stone. So just as Jesus was broken, but then miraculously he is restored and brought back to life, and then where does he go? He goes to heaven. Where in heaven? Into the temple to serve, to continue his ministry of intercession. It's possible. It is arguable. It is reasonable that God brought together those broken stones, restored them, and they sit restored in perfection, returned back into heaven in the... Remember, there are two arcs. The ark on earth was a model... The sanctuary on earth was a symbol and a model of the heavenly sanctuary that's in heaven, right? Sometimes we forget this. This is part of the story. There is a sanctuary in heaven, amen? Are there any Seventh-day Adventists here today? Okay, there's a few of you out there. There is a sanctuary in heaven in which Jesus serves now. There is an ark in heaven. And what is in that ark? Is it an empty box? Or is there a restored fixed, mended of that original sapphire foundational tablet originally given to Moses. I think that that's what happened. That's why the Bible has nothing more to say about those broken tablets. They were left, I'm guessing, and God brought them to heaven and put them back together because it started in heaven just as Jesus started in heaven. The giving of the law at Mount Sinai was the most and dramatic was the most dramatic and significant personal intervention of God since creation and the fall in the garden of Eden. And again, we we have to remember sometimes we we put this experience of God giving the law into into a small box of just, you know, this was part of the story and it, it meant something at that point and it, it was kind of neat and there was fire and lightning and, and all these things and but but then these other things happen and that kind of gets overshadowed. Okay? When you look at it from the greater cosmic experience of the likelihood that this was actually a gift from God, an embodiment of his word an incarnation of his character in light of, and almost as, and again, I don't want to say it, it, it supersedes the person of Jesus Christ, but it is of the same vein of the incarnation of Christ. Jesus Christ was an incarnation of the character of God just as much as the law given at Sinai was an incarnation of the character of God. This this becomes so important when we think of it in the context of what does the law mean then in the last days? Why do you think Satan hates the law so much? Why do why are people, why are Christians so quick to criticize or to downplay or to make secondary at least the law or part of the law? And it becomes quite comical, actually, when you start to read other commentaries and how other Christians have dealt with the Ten Commandments. They say, oh, they're wonderful, they're great, everything is right, what God says, and we should uh, we should follow it at all times. And then when you start talking about the particulars of the law, they say, wonderful, what about the Sabbath? Then it's, oh, well, things changed. It's not as important as it once was. 
They're very happy to follow nine of the ten, but that tenth one, somehow following nine commands, you're free and everything, but if you follow ten commands, you're a legalist. And um, it, it, becomes, it becomes a challenge uh, when we consider what the role of the law is in the last days. God manifested his divine character and unchanging authority when he gave the law, but in a significant way, that first gift chiseled from his very throne room, from the foundation of his throne, And then restored, possibly, by his miraculous power and returned to heaven to reside there at at the seat of the authority as Jesus serves in the heavenly sanctuary as well. Is it not clear why the devil hates God's law? He hates the law as much as he hates God. We should not be surprised when in the last days it is the law of God and the values and principles expressed in the law of God that is causing so much challenge to his people. And I'm not just speaking about the Sabbath, although the Sabbath is one of the things that we as Seventh-day Adventists have found great blessing and and difference than than, uh, uh, historical Christianity coming out of the Reformation has found. Next week, I hope to go into this a little bit more. Next week, I'm going to talk about just the first command. And I'm not going to spend 10 weeks going one by one by one. At least that's not the plan, Jeff, unless the Lord uh, says differently. But next week, I want to talk about just that first command. You shall have no other gods before me. How that command, not to put it ahead of the other nine, not to say that it's more important, but how that command in the context of the law, and that first, the first of the 10 words, addresses the main challenge of Satan and answers many of the major questions that we in the church have today as well. So I hope that that'll be something you can pray, uh, look forward to and pray for me as, as I hope that that can be a blessing for you. Um, but we're going to continue this journey next week. Can you bow your heads with me and we'll close this service today. Gracious God in heaven, Lord, it is, is my hope that these These things that are shared here, while they may sound trivial, they may sound nuanced, Father, I pray that we would see the the core issue. And and yes, it's interesting to see how colors have symbolism and how these things can, can teach us lessons throughout the biblical narrative. Lord, help it not to overshadow that greater idea, Lord, that within your law, you have given us a transcript of your character. You've given us a light. You have literally pulled from your throne and given us a gift that is a manifestation of your will and of your word. Lord, help us not to neglect to to seek out the meaning and, and profound purpose that that has. Thank you that we can study the Bible together. Thank you, Lord, that we live in the days in which we live Help us to be part of your great plan, to be ready for your return and to help as many of those we know and love to also be ready. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you folks. Happy Sabbath. Enjoy the rest of this lovely day and uh, we hope to see you next week.